In March and June 1963, the first two solo exhibitions of one of the most influential and inventive media artists of the late 20th century took place at two different galleries in West Germany. For these events, Nam Jung Paik had assembled a number of objects and installations that offered a weird mapping of the media ecology that had emerged during the previous, the pre previous decades, but which could actually be traced back to the late 19th century. Uh, the gallery visitors were thus confronted with a set of radically rebuilt and reconfigured audiovisual technologies marked by humorous and suggestive DIY aesthetics. There are some slides from the, from the shows. For instance, six television sets that were connected with, among other things, a radio, the signals of which generated the visual output on the screens, a piano with mechanical arms and a bra, scaffolds with vertically stretched wires around which gramophone records were spinning, uh, and a gramophone combined with a pipe with a rotating head at one end, which was to be placed at the spinning record. You can see it here on the right hand side while the other end of the pipe should be inserted into the listener's mouth. Yeah. The most resonant work, at least for our, in our context here, was however the installation Random Access. Uh, presented in a basement at the Gallery Parnas in Wuppertal. This installation consisted of a number of plastic audio tapes mounted on a wall in an abstract and layered pattern. On the floor below, the piece was completed with a tape recorder and a loudspeaker, manifesting an acoustic dimension which however demanded an active visitor, viewer and listener. The latter, the, the visitor then at the gallery, was provided with a movable tape head to be attached or stroked to the tape on the wall in order to tra transduce the magnetic pattern on the tape to electric signals and eventually to generate sound. If this latter aspect of random access displays a participatory aesthetics that would flourish in the near avant-garde of the 1960s, Pike's work also points out a set of media cultural practices that would emerge during the late 20th century and which can be linked to the materials used in the work. That is, the magnetic media that have been crucial and necessary for the storage, processing, reproduction and distribution of information during the last half century or so through everything from audio cassettes to hard drives. Uh, more specifically, it is one of the most well-known magnetic technologies that is employed by Pike in his piece. The tape recorder and its audio tape, a commodity that had been circulating on the market for just a little more than a decade at this point in time, but which would soon spread globally and become one of the most used technologies of reproduction in history. Embodied in everything from reel-to-reel -reel recorders to 8-track machines in American cars, <laughs> to Sony Walkmans and digital recording devices. The tape recorder would, and I guess some of you remember this, of course, uh, would infiltrate the shifting forms of and activities of culture, society, and everyday life during this post-war period. Above all, it would radicalize the phonographic apparatus to use and tweak Michael Foucault's, Michel Foucault's concept slightly, uh, that emerged with the invention of Edison and the phonograph already in 1877, but which increased, so to speak, with tape recording emerging in post-war years, and which, would result, which has resulted in an overwhelming, if now naturalized, uh, transformation of the sonosphere. As sound historians Michael Bull and Les Back wrote some 10 years ago now in an <coughs> introduction to Sound Studies Anthology, Today, the experience of everyday life is increasingly mediated by a multitude of mechanically reproduced sounds. And one might even bring this a step further and claim that recorded and technically distributed sound plays a crucial role in regulating and producing perception, thinking and feeling. It is an integral part of what Jacques Rancière would call the distribution of the sensible. 
The phonographic apparatus does then provide a kind of backdrop for my talk, or rather constitutes the ecology within which my observations and analysis will take place. I will, as the title of my talk, then suggest uh, address tape recording as a technology and practice in relation to literature and art from the 1950s and uh, 1960s mainly. That is the Cold War period. And I will try to map certain features of a tape recorded poetics while at the same time uh, approaching the words discussed as kinds of media archaeological probes for understanding not only the history of media uh, and the relationship between media, uh, media technologies and art, but also potentially for studying the ubiquitous digital media networks of today. My underlying, the underlying thesis uh, <coughs> was with this project then, and this I guess, uh, that tape recording can be perceived as a kind of general rehearsal, put it crudely, for later more uh, widespread media practices, which might then in different ways shed light on how media determine our situation in the 21st century. Uh, but before going on then, uh, my talk today stems from uh, an earlier research project of mine, as Sasha mentioned, which I began in earnest, I think, in 2000, late 2007 or 2008. And it has resulted, as mentioned as well, in a small book in Swedish from 2011, and a section of essays in the book uh, that Sasha showed there, the green one, which was published last year, and both written in Swedish. I have also published some essays in English in journals and anthologies and so on, and the plan was, and this I guess perhaps still, to close the project with a short book in English, but that still waits, as I have during the last couple of years been busy doing other things. Uh, consequently, for my, for my part, then, this, this tape recorder has been in sleep mode for a while, so it feels a, both a bit uh, shaky and, uh, and also, in a way, interesting to return to it here today, as Sasha, as Sasha asked me to do then, and I have been thinking about it for a while, so yeah. But I will kind of look forward to it, to it anyway. And that was my compulsory caveat, of course. Okay. okay. Yeah. And then the first real section comes, called Magnetic Media. Uh, my ambition uh, today is then to tell some media stories about tape recording that are connected to a current media ecology, and which might, might function as a critical leverage in discussion of post, discussions of post-war art and literature as well, as well as our, of our contemporary situation. Uh, but such an ambition should be backed up by at least a brief account of the longer history of magnetic media and tape. Uh, and as you surely know, uh, the history of magnetic recording is almost as old as the history of the phonograph. After having seen uh, Edison's machine in early 1878, and after having been duly fascinated, but also troubled by it, the American engineer Oberlin Smith set out to sophisticate the phonograph, and most importantly, to get rid of the kind of inherent noise in, the, in its mechanical machinery, you know, with the grooves and so on, the so cylinders. And already in the fall of 1878, uh, Oberlin Smith came up with the concept of storing sound magnetically as a, an alternative to, to, to uh, phonographic uh, recording. Uh, as Smith wrote in a letter from the same period, and I quote him here, and we have the, the, the quote on, on, the, on the slide there as well. I have invented yet another improvement of the talking phonograph. It is, however, the object of further experimental investigation when it comes to the capacity of a thin wire, and at this time, of course, they use thin uh, wire recording, a thin wire, probably tempered iron, to receive magnetism through the induction of, a, of electric current through a short surrounding spiral in spots or zones of shifting intensity on different parts of its extension, the wire's extension. The advantages in cost, simplicity, and delic delicacy are obvious, as is the easiness with which it can be stored, wounded on cheap spools, just as sewing cotton. Another quote. And you also have like a, 
a vision description or like a drawing of the of the a diagram of the, of the of the mechanism to uh, conceive them. Uh, <laughs> Spots or zones of shifting intensity is quite a beautiful rendering of magnetic storage. But Smith would never be able to manufacture a working machine. This had to wait until the final years of the century. If the phonograph had been the incentive, the incentive for Smith, it was instead Alexander Graham Bell's telephone that became a starting point for the Danish engineer, Valdemar Poulsen, and his creation of the telegraphone. Uh, the problem that haunted Poulsen was the dead, end the, dead end the dead end of the telephone conversations, that is, the unanswered call. Why wasn't it possible, Poulsen thought, to leave a message if the intended and sought for addressee was not present when calling? Just as Edison considered the phonograph primarily as an apparatus for dictation, the kind of views that Poulsen had in mind when he began experimenting was then related to talking and to verbal expression. In the summer of 1898, Poulsen discovered, discovered that it was possible to record a sound on a piano wire with the help of a microphone from a telephone connected to an electromagnet. By manually moving the magnet along the wire as he spoke into the microphone, magnetic fields emerged which could store and transform sound waves in patterns. These sounds could later on be reproduced if one moved the magnet along the piano wire at the same pace again, while this time being connected to the loudspeaker from the phone. Paul Paulson soon filed for patent, I think in December of 1898 or something like that. And about a year later, uh, the telegraphone became a great success at the World Fair in Paris in 1900, where it, where it was awarded a Grand Prix and was explored by a number of celebrities such as uh, the Siemens family and Emile Zola. Several recordings were made at this event, of course, among others of the Austrian Emperor Franz Josef which is today, I think, the oldest uh, actual existing preserved uh, magnetic recording. Uh, the telegraphone was, however, hampered by technical limitations that seemed difficult to overcome. The crucial problem was uh, the amplification of the outgoing signal. Apart from this, this there, was also, there, were, there were also political, commercial and judicial problems haunting the machine. For example, since the telegraph phone was built to record telephone messages, it was also doomed to be considered as a threat against integrity and privacy, against all kinds of activity that was based on secrecy, one must say. And consequently, wire recorders, to use the generic term that was uh, invented, uh, wire recorders entered the shadows of media history for a while. Uh, in one specific context, the technology would, however, find an exclusive usage. When the US Navy, a little more than, let's say, 15 years later, during World War II, after many attempts, managed to intercept the radio traffic from German submarines, all that they could hear was a kind of hissing sound beyond every identifiable code. But in 1916, this enigma was sold. The whistling noise, uh, the medium's, medium's own ghostly voice, so to speak, was nothing other than the transmission of magnetic recordings at an extremely high speed. A nice confirmation of the dramatological hypothesis of uh, Virilion, of course. So in order to decrypt the recordings, a slowing down intervention <coughs> was necessary, a playback of the sounds that they could hear on magnetic medium, medium such as a uh, telegraphone. Thus, the te technology was implemented in a setting that in the future would be, be a decisive play field for its formation and transformations. Uh, this military setting was also then present when the modern recorder finally found its, found its uh, form in pre-war and World War II Germany. Here, a number of machines would succeed each other. 
such as the Blattner phone, the Echo phone, the Textophone, and the Stahltone band machine, and so on. There were several different types that were conceived and produced. Uh, these recorders were really big machines with some ungainly steel tapes, which were actually edited with the danger of your life because they were steel, so you could, you could cut yourself very bad if you tried to edit sound of the recordings. Uh, the real breakthrough for the tape recorder came, however, however with the collaboration of AEG Far Farben and Bass during the 1930s which led to the production or the invention of the so-called magnetophone. The most important thing about the magnetophone uh, was, that it was, was that it was provided with a carrier with a coat, as a tape then, a carrier with a coating of iron oxide where the magnetic patterns could be described. Um, well, first they used paper as a base for the tape, but then later on plastic. So it was much more easy to edit, of course. And the first magnetophone K1 was presented in 1935 at the big radio exhibition in Berlin, and it immediately became a success. But it was still too expensive to be marketed. But already in 1938, a commercially viable uh, version uh, uh, was invented or produced, namely K4, which became the most important uh, recorder for the German. The Germans uh, Naturally, the magnetophone would find a place in the German war machine. As General von Wedel of the German army concluded, and I quote him here from Friedrich Kittler, of course, a crucial, crucial change took place after the magnetophone was invented and formed for military report. Original reports of battle from the air command, the mobile infantry, or the submarine, etc., now turn into new, impressive first hand accounts. End of quote. It was also in war torn Germany some years later at the radio station in Bad Nauheim that the American soldier and the recording enthusiast Jack Mullin bumped into a K 4 and suddenly understood how orchestral music with perfect quality of sound could have been played in the middle of the night on German radio broadcasts during the war. Mali was allowed to bring back two K4s to California as booty in order to investigate and transform the recorder and, and transform it into an American commodity and product. Uh, and soon, a year or so afterwards, the listeners of the po very popular Bing Crosby radio show, Filk or Radio Time, found themselves utterly sheeted. The jokes and questions that captured the listeners and absorbed them into the presence and the intimacy of the radio medium were all recorded and edited months before being broad broadcast. So, uh, Tape recording would then, only a few years after World War II, infiltrate Western culture and society. And in the decades to come, in the 50s, 60s, and 70s, it would spread almost globally. At first, it's, uh, it was not its role as a machine for listening to music that was emphasized. In the 50s, the tape recorder was rather, as the many handbooks and manuals uh, underline, considered as a tool uh, that could be put to use in a number of professions and practices as well as in everyday life. The machine was to be employed by journalists and oral historians, psychoanalysts, uh, and you're probably familiar with the famous account uh, that the Sartre tells about later on in the 60s where the analyst on tapes his, uh, records his uh, psychoanalysts. It's a nice anecdote from this, this tape recorded culture. Uh, it was used by um, uh, psychoanalysts and policemen, medical doctors, of course, and high school teachers, and so on. Uh, the lists of potential uses presented in the handbooks uh, gives an idea of this uh, versatility of the medium, ranging from the production of acoustic family albums to party music to language courses to secret recordings. Uh, the latter had actually been a publicized, heavily publicized aspect of sound recording ever since its inception around 1900. One book that came out already in the 1890s um, told about um, 
um, secret recording as, as a, a kind of part gimmick. <coughs> recording as a part and so on secretly and then play it, play out uh, recordings for the, for the other guests, which is yeah. <laughs> somewhat too delicate uh, or problematic <laughs> practice, perhaps. Um, uh, anyway, uh, secret recordings have been a part of uh, uh, sound recording since its inception. So its importance uh, as intelligence and surveillance technique and as a symbol for clandestine polit politics during the Cold War was very well pre prepared for. Oh, I've lost the... There you go. Uh, I'm just having some stuff. Uh, yeah, it, was, it became of course a kind of symbol for, for, this, for surveillance culture and so on during the uh, Cold War. As soon as the tape recorder became consumer goods then in the 1950s and even earlier than that, it was also to become, be employed in different ways by artists and poets and composers. The Musique Concrète by French composer and radio engineer Pierre Schaeffer, based on recording and edited sound, was first made with the help of serially connected turntables in the 1940s when, when this kind of music was invented. But in a couple of years, Schaeffer would switch to the tape recorder. And already in, in, in the early 1950s, the, the ever far-sighted young Cage would come to explore the machine's potential in pieces such as Williams' Mix, a dense and multi-form sound collage in which the bass consists of pre-recorded sounds which has been intensely cut and spliced hundreds of times. The materiality of tape and its making spatial of an art form and a medium usually connected to and embodied in time was also observed early on by John Cage, <coughs> who in commenting on his, on his piece William Smith noted that with audio tape, and I quote Cage here, the second, which we had always considered as a very short time, now became 15 inches, and I quote. This materialization and spatialization of time had at least in principle become tangible already with Edison's phonograph. According to Kittler, the phonographic apparatus paved the way for a concrete manipulation of temporal processes, what Kittler himself famously designed as TAM, TAM, Time Axis Manipulation. If literature and poetry, for example, had experimented with such manipulations on a symbolical level, level before, in permutations or palindromes or different narrative conceits, these interventions could now take place in the real, as Kittler said. And as you probably know, Kittler would map Lacan's ontological uh, distinction between the real, the imaginary, and the symbolic onto, the, onto the, the new 19th century media that would also give him the name to one of his first books, the gramophone film and typewriter. So the gramophone, the symbolic film, imaginary and typewriter. Uh, symbolic, also the gramophone from the real um, film, imaginary and typewriter. Symbolic. Uh, after Edison then, acoustic slices of life were to be stored in grooves on wax cylinder, cylinders and later in magnetic patterns on tape. Now I have to step back, I guess, there we have some non magnetic patterns on tape. Even if the sounds heard could be inter interpreted as signs, these signs also carried a, a heavy or strong indexical dimension to use the concept established by Pierce. There was a physical relation between the sound and its sign, or rather between the sound and its reproduced version. The sound hits a membrane in a microphone that is tra transformed into an electric signal that produces a magnetic field or pattern in a layer of iron oxide. And I will come back later to this elementary materiality of signals and patterns and its aesthetic exploration by poets and artists. Anyhow, these material circumstances would soon invite comparisons uh, with photography. That is kind of topos actually in the in manuals and tape recorders. The comparison emphasized the index, but more importantly, it produced an aura of realism uh, around the tape recorder, which paved the way for an understanding of, rec of tape recording as documentary, <coughs> as a method for capturing unmediated reality. We know, of course, from Bolter's and Grusin's anal analysis in remediation that this is a recurrent figure in media history. 
and the search for realist immediacy would underpin one of, one of the main aesthetic strands of a tape-recorded place during the post-war years. It would inform and shape uh, a number of works, a number of kinds of works, ranging from beat poetry to oral history. From one point of view, this is of course, this of course is a little bit weird. A new media technology is invented and put to use, and its mediating capacity is instantly obliterated for the presence of the thing, media, thing mediated. On the other hand, this was far from the whole story around the tape recorder. The most salient feature of tape was actually its malleability and capacity for changes and transformations. In distinction to the more rigid uh, gramophone recording, recalcitrant to post-production, tape recording was a practice that thrived on edit editorial operations or editorial aesthetics, as was manifested in the manual's detailed descriptions on how to cut and splice, for example, or as can be heard in, uh, in the Williams, piece, Williams mix piece by Cage. And even though the expressive force of a, of a collage such as Williams Mix partly comes from real sounds, uh, the, the, the form of the piece is highly artificial, shaped by the, by, by the numerous uh, editorial and interventions. So, when it comes to tape poetics, the real is thus always contaminated by the unreal, the authentic by the artificial, the truth by the false and vice versa. Or as, a high, or as a historian of recorded music has put it, and I have a quote here from, oh, uh, from uh, a book by uh, Greg Milner called Perfectly Sound Forever. And he writes there, Tape reshaped the contours of recorded music, first by linking sounds that had not been linked in their original incarnation, and eventually by allowing sounds that had occurred at different times to be experienced simultaneously. You could stack sounds on top of sounds, a disc recording, you could stack sounds on top of sounds. A disc recording <coughs> lasted only as long as it took to record. With tape, you were limited only by the time you had on this earth. Sorry, I pressed the good. You could conceivably spend your entire life just, life just making one record, endlessly splicing, rearranging, or adding sounds. You could make a record that was not in fact a record. It didn't document or preserve something that had happened. As a child of the phonographic age, Frederick Ramsey, who was one of the early field recorders in the US, heard in magnetic recording, a magnetic recording way to get closer to the truth. It also promised something quite different. Magnetism itself may be a universal truth, but magnetic recording taught music how to lie. And of course. destroyed by the transfer from Apple to another system. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, okay, now the next part. Well, I'll go into some more artworks and, and art, artistic practices. Then. But there are certainly more to be said about these traits that I've mentioned, about the indexicality and editorial poetics and so on, but let, let us now move on to some concrete cases of a post-war tape recorded poetics. That a number of artists would explore the, the aesthetic potential of the technology is well known. And this is true even if one avoids the obvious case of music. During the 1950s and 60s, novelists such as Paul Bowles and Georges Perec, playwrights such as Arthur Miller and Jean-Paul Sartre, poets such as Allen Ginsberg, Ginsberg and Paul Blackburn, Lily Greenham and Bernard Heitzek, and a number of artists from Robert Morris and Yoko Ono to Art and Language, Bruce Naumann and Laurie Anderson would approach the technology with different means and for different events. In some cases, the technology was employed as a kind of motive or a metaphor in a poem or a story. In other cases, it functioned as a formal model for looping a text, for example, or as a stage prop in a play or an installation. But in many instances, the machine was actually used to expand the actual methods and materials of poetry and art with the help of recorders, microphones, and the exploration of electronic signals, etc. 
which also engendered an exploration of issues on subjectivity, society, technology, and the environment. The most famous instance in literature during this time period is perhaps Samuel Beckett's play, Crap's Last Tape, from 1950. Ah, yeah. There we go. Uh, where we meet the old man Crap on stage, listening to and reflecting upon his past via old tape recordings from his previous birthdays. Among other things, Beckett's piece investigates the tension just mentioned between realism and artifice, documentation and editing. One critic of the play, Rebecca Komai, has even described Krapp's words and deeds on stage as being performed in what she calls an editorial mode, showing how Krapp's behavior in many ways mimics the operations of his tape recorder, bringing man and machine closer to each other. Uh, for example, the famous uh, scene where the crap remembers the, the, his former love story in the, in the punt, and when he, and when he looks at the woman's breasts, and you have the isomorphism with the tape, and, and he leans over the tape, so you have like a kind of as a morphism between technology and human nerves. That kind of um, closeness is played out in different ways in the, in, 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 in the, in the, in the play. Then. This is also played out within the framework of the play's central theme, of course, memory, which especially in some renditions, such as uh, Atomegoyan's wonderful uh, staging with John Hurt, and this is set from Egoyan's uh, uh, rendition of uh, crap from 2000, um, in which memory is imagined as a material external archive as much as an inner mental or virtual space. Have you seen this uh, rendition? The stage is cluttered with materials. Usually Beckett preferred the, you know, the clean aesthetic staging of his place, but the, the Goyans version is cluttered with papers and tapes and stuff and so on. So how like it's like actually an archive, so to speak, takes place. Uh, as all readers of Beckett know, issues about prosthetics and interaction between humans, material art and material artifacts and even technologies are kind of prominent in his work. In the years that followed crap, um, technological paraphernalia would be crucial also in the compositional methods tried out. A stake here is the technological aspects of the apparatus or the dispositive, what Siegfried Zelinsky has named the media as a system, and which he contrasts with media practices, right? And media art practices. And how it shapes or rather produces subjects. This media technological aspect of subjectification processes, how it partakes in the forming of phenomena such as voice, memory, affect, and self expression is a recurrent uh, problem in the works of interest here. If these works, on the one hand, tell something about media technologies yesterday and today, they are also, to use the words of Yusuf Parika, and I quote Yusuf Parika here, they are also able to illuminate the variety of these devices and the technological relations as part of regimes of biopolitics and affect. They can be seen as archaeolo archaeologists in this sense as well, investigating how technology and technological media aesthetics stand as a crucial form in terms of management of what we feel, perceive, and read." End of the quote. In the following, I want to take a quick look at how such processes emerged in poetry and art with, tape, with the tape recording in the 60s. And I will begin in a specific and uh, politically and epistemically charged context where tape recorders had a key, played a key role in the surveillance and control cultures of the Cold War. Uh, that issues of surveillance are relevant in discussions of art and poetry in general is no news. Not only are a lot of visual and verbal representations impingent upon such things as secret observation, the organization of scopic regimes, the management of data, behavioral patterns, and social re relations, and so on. The novels of Balzac are, from a certain perspective, perfectly possible to read as surveillance records from the Paris of the early 19th century. 
But also the reception of art with its voyeuristic dimensions comes close to visual control and eavesdropping. As John Stuart Mill once famously claimed about poetry, it is not heard but overheard. These issues were, however, to make an especially intriguing case from the 1960s and onward, which must be linked to mistrust breeding Cold War politics, but also to cybernetics, <coughs> information and game theories, and not least to new recording technologies. When Andy Warhol first tested his first video camera in 1965 and was asked by the magazine uh, uh, tape recording, I think it was called actually, uh, when he was asked what he liked about the new gadget, his answer was telling and laconic. You can spy on people with it. Warhol was also a pioneer in forging a link between audio tape, surveillance, and art through his extensive recordings of friends' talks, friends' talk and telephone conversation, conversations, some of which were captured in his book of 1968, A and Novel a 450-page transcription of 24 hours of audio tape, mainly from factory in New York. In this endeavor, Warhol was, however, influenced uh, by another group of mediatized artists and writers in post-war uh, America, namely the Beats, whose work with tape recorders dated as far back as 1950 when Neil Cassidy bought an echo tape recorder, which was used for recording conversations and readings that he did together with Jack Kerouac, uh, which became an important asset in the development of Kerouac's spontaneous prose. Another beat poet who would both explore and be troubled by these issues was Allen Ginsberg. On the one hand, Ginsberg had good reasons for being worried of the US intelligence. Later records have confirmed that he was targeted by the FBI. Ginsberg was also a, a visible public figure and a controversial writer at the time, both for being connected to leftist politics and for being gay. Uh, the indictment against his poem How, from 1956, on charges of obscenity, was perhaps the most explicit link uh, between his work and the authorities. But the experience of being surveyed by the police uh, would also leave frequent traces in Ginsberg's Ginsberg's writings from the period. In an early poem in his book Planet News, uh, a poem called Journal Night Thoughts, dated January 1961, Ginsberg thus attests, and I quote him here, and now I'm paranoid every day about the cops and God and universe, as if it were all being tape recorded from my skull, end of quote. And in the following long media-saturated piece in the, in, in, in the book, Television Was a Baby Crawling Toward That Death Chamber, that's the title of the poem, uh, composed in the winter of 1961, Ginsberg comes back to the feeling of being monitored by a cosmic tape recorder and microphone, like we were living in, a, in, a, in an immense panoricon, to pun on Bentham's uh, concept, where someone can always hear you bug you and rip your thought and voice from your body and soul for distribution in an unknown territory. On the other hand, Ginsberg would also come to confront and use the tape recorder that he feared so much, or the technologies that he feared so much. In December 1965, he got hold of a tape recorder of his own, the first tape recorder of his own. According to the, bio, his, to the biographer Barry Miles, he was given the money by Bob Dylan to buy a top-of-the-line portable reel-to-reel, -reel, which he would use when he traveled across the U.S. in his, uh, in his car, a Beetle, I think it was, during the 60s, later, latter half of the 60s. This tape machine was thus integrated into a lifelong relationship with the recording. And there are marvelous, there's a marvelous collection of Ginsberg's recordings that stand for uh, both on real to real and on cassettes. Uh, he used it everywhere. It's a lot of, really a lot of materials. On the one hand, these tapes would be used as material for transcription of, of poetry, uh, which, which was later on published in books then. On the other hand, as I just mentioned, a rich archive of tapes would also be established. established. But what was then the driving force behind this practice of Ginsberg? 
As Michael Davidson, the American uh, critic and scholar, has underlined, Ginsburg's use of tape recording was a counterattack on the objectification of voice that the expanding mass media and surveillance culture of the Cold War contributed to. That is, how voice became some, becomes something to record and manipulate, something deprived of its bodily roots, its roots in the here and now in time and space, uh, and thus becomes more of an object or a set of data to be sorted and used. The intimate voice of the poet on tape is then, <coughs> becomes then for Ginsburg a possibility for poetry to return to its oral sources and to confront the corruption this kind of corruption of the voice with the living word of the poet. So it's a kind of romantic image of the poet that, that's animated here, right? Activated here. A poetic word that reconstitutes the voice as rooted in self presence, self plenitude, and the interiority of the speaking subject. But at the same time, this constitution of voice was, of course, risked as soon as it was captured on the easily radical radical and editable audio tape. Just as much as countering media speak with an embodied voice, Ginsberg's recorded word blurred the distinction then between an authentic voice and the verbal din of the public space. Ginsberg's poetic and tape recording practice thus risks betraying the very idea of an authentic and private poetic voice which is in its turn then complicates some ideas underlying acoustic surveillance and eavesdropping. If the intimate voice and personal matters in general, love, sex, etc., and there's a lot of that in Ginsberg's poetry, of course, if they go public in poetry, then the idea of listening in on subjects without their knowledge loses some of its edge, some of its epistemic force, and its political raison d'etre. So there's a paradox there in Ginsberg's work. It was at this specific juncture that Ginsberg's uh, friend and the sometime collaborator, William S. Burroughs, another keen tape recordist of the period, would find incentive to put find incentive both to uh, incentive to, cland to clandestine politi politics as well as to the necessity for art and literature, and especially then to tape recorded poetics to challenge the workings of a private sphere based on shame, fear, and concealment. As Burroughs would later contend in relation to the Watergate affair during the next decade. And I quote Burroughs here. It is precisely by breaking down the whole concept of privacy that the monopoly, the monopoly of Nixon administration wishes to set up will be broken down. When nobody cares about the distinction between privacy and public, then shame ceases to exist, and we can all return to the Garden of Eden without any god crawling around like a house dick with a tape recorder. End of quote. I think I have a Burroughs slide there. Yeah. For Burroughs, whose interest in tape recording grew out of his interest in the cut-up method and was developed together with his friends and collaborators, collaborators Brian Geis and Ian Somerville, Tape recorded practice explicitly became both media politics and biopolitics. Burroughs wanted to transform the opponent's weapon, I mean the, the control machines or the mil mil military industrial complexes, weapon of secret recordings into an asset in his own counter poetics, in which cuts and splices uh, of tapes scrambled the information channels of the, of the military industrial complex or the control machine. For Burroughs, the editorial potential of the tape recorder, the rich possibilities of manipulation of tapes or recordings, was the starting point for a critique as well as for generating new words and aesthetic experiences, rather than for recovering a lost voice or a lost authentic voice, as was the mission for Ginsburg. Then. And I have another quote here from Burroughs, and Burroughs, one of Burroughs' texts on tape recording. And, that, and that's the quote on the screen, on the slide here. Results are obtained by constant playback of carefully prepared tapes. All tape recording tricks are useful. Echo chamber for stations and air terminals, overlay, speed up, slow down, oscillation, etc. Getting results is a matter of persistence and experimentation. And I quote. 
The writer and artist can thus disturb surveillance culture and its control systems and their technological constitution by producing noise or positive feedback. A culture based on strict demarcation lines between private and public, interior and exterior, even between subject and object, are in this way challenged from within, so to speak. Ginsberg's tape poetry and the paradoxes that it engenders is a case in point, as is Burroughs' insights that we can uh, take part of here in this course. But I would now like to take a look at some other works that further underscores this uh, situation this kind of critique from within, so to speak. I will then first turn to one of the most prolific American poets and artists of the late 1960s, Vito Acconci. In 1969, Acconci was on his way to lead the writing of poetry, which has, he had been working on during the 60s, uh, and especially perhaps in the journal that he had together with um, Oh, now I lost her name. Um, Bernard Mayer, right? Zero to nine, yeah. Uh, in 1969, Akonshi was on his way to lead the writing of poetry for a more heterogeneous art practice. He had begun working with performance pieces in which the body as well as issues of private, private and public are the center of gravity. At least one of these pieces pertained directly to surveillance. Uh, his famous following piece was performed every day from October 3 to October 25th in the fall of 1969 and was based on the idea of randomly selecting a passerby on the street and to follow him or her until the person disappeared into a private space not accessible to the artist. An activity that was documented in photographs and in written notes uh, by a country. And a you can see a country here on the screen, of course. Uh, another public piece uh, from the same year, you know, from the same uh, poll, it also included a tape recorder. And actually, I thought did a lot of tape recorders piece, pieces during these years. The performance Running Tape took place in Central Park in New York on August 26, and was part of a series of so-called tape situations carried out by a country uh, at this period. The score for the work for conscious work is as follows, it's very short, I will quote it. Cassette recorder on my belt, microphone in my hand. Running and counting each step as I run. Brackets. When I have to, when my words get jumbled, when I'm out of breath, I stop and breathe, stop and breathe into the microphone, catching my breath until I can continue my run, continue my count. End of quote and end of uh, score. The tape, as well as the man is running, and there's of course a double entendre in the title here, in running tape. Running tape, running man, and a kind of cyborg in double entendre. Running, counting, breathing, recording in public. public. Yes, but why? To answer that question, let me make a quick excursion to another work on tape recording from the very same year, 1969. A book by the English teacher and pedagogue D. Neville Wood called On Tape, The Creative Use of the Tape Recorder. In this book, Wood discusses the potential in using tape recorders at schools and universities to enhance the methods of learning. And the relation between art, tape recording, and learning is a separate chapter, actually, in my project that I'm writing about, Conch and David Anton and others who address tape and pedagogy and, and, and learning labs and stuff like that, language labs. Anyway, uh, the most well-known application of tape recording in such a context, such a school context, was, of course, its role in establishing uh, learning studios and language labs, which is a field analyzed at length by Wood in this book. But he also suggests how the use of tape recording can be expanded in, in the school context. In his own school, Wood had set up an elaborate system of recorders and looped wires to which to which the students were connected through headphones with transmitters. Now, such a system would admit might evoke ideas of mass indoctrination as he writes. But even if the teacher, to a certain extent, controls the output and, and the feedback of the system, 
The intention is to instill in the headphone-carrying headphone pupils the capacity for self-governance and self-learning, just like in the language lab zone. This certainly offers Wrightwood right uh, a degree of self-correction and concentration that would be difficult to imagine in more traditional teaching methods and approach. Such a system, uh, definitely a kind of surveillance system then, seems to install itself on the threshold between two paradigms heavily theorized during the last decades. On the one hand, the panoptic or relation to Ginsburg and the panoptic system based on the experience of being watched or heard by an external observer. <coughs> on the other hand, the control society later mapped by Gilles Deleuze. A conscious running tape seems to dramatize such a threshold in a way. Voice is here not the authentic utterance of the soul, not Ginsberg's voice uh, of self-presence, which might challenge as, well as, challenge as well as get corrupted by the media technological soundscapes. The voice here is an instrument for keeping the body in check as it places itself in public space. The only vocal trace from an inner space is the runner's forced breath, which disrupts, which disrupts the numerical sequence and the continuous self-monitoring of the artist. But this is not really the voice of the poet, not even a romantic poet's sigh. It is rather the noise of the body that can be heard on a conscious recording. A couple of years later, another performance uh, much, reminiscent, much reminiscent of a conscious was made by the Polish conceptual artist Richard Vasco, a performance matter of factually titled uh, From A to B and Back to A, and was done in 1974. You have some photographs from the, from the performance here on the slide. This time, a camera in a fixed position was used to document the actions um, uh, of the artist taking place, who also, just as a conscious, carried with him a portable sound recording device uh, while entering this public space, a park and a square, I think. And as he walked, Vasco then recorded the faint sound of his steps against the pavement, as well as serial announcements of the distance that he had covered in meters. On the one hand, works such as these, and there are others quite, quite similar, are related to a mapping of the everyday life that engaged um, conceptual artists in the late 60s and early 70s. The media technologies are then used, uh, are thus part of the documentary devices used in, in, this, in this mapping. On the other hand, both of these works embody a new relationship to media and to the self. They investigate the network where voice, body, measuring and technology are linked to issues of self-surveillance, self-control and self-governance. It is thus pertinent to recall the observations of Deleuze about the transition from a disciplinary society to a controlled society characterized by, among other things, of course, numer numerical use of numerical codes and self-surveillance and so on. There is a dis distinct difference here and, uh, in relation to Ginsburg and so on. Bodies and minds are no longer surveilled and controlled by the identifiable external power, but are incorporated into a cybernetic assemblage of different agential forces. This assemblage captures the kind of prosthetic being that, were, that was uh, frequently discussed by McLuhan and others in the 60s, and which were also addressed in artworks from many artworks from the period. At the same time, it anticipates, not least through the emphasis on counting and measuring, a more contemporary subjectivity <coughs> shaped by self-measuring technologies today, controlling health, sleep, eating, exercising, and whatever. We get here a glimpse of the future data citizen, to use Jeff Bowker's term, that is produced within the digital networks of the 21st century. At least these words can be used in a reading or an analysis of this digital network, I would say. Okay, then I come to the last actual part of my talk. Um, 
The works of Akonchi and Wasco and others can thus be said to display the technical and political conditions of a cultural transformation, which also carries with it a certain form of biopolitics. As such, they can be used as a historical sounding board, as I just mentioned, in analyzing the digital apparatus of today. Moreover, the central op aesthetic operation that governed these, their works, and which used the tape recorder as a crucial device, is based on control as manifested in a system of feedback and more precisely, negative feedback. The da data generated are fed back into the system in order to stabilize and regulate it. Still, and not least in the piece by a conscious, this system is also threatened by noise, by the noise, of the, body, by the noise of the body, as we heard, but also the noise of the recording <coughs> device itself, which is very mu much present in, the, in, in a conscious uh, recording. Uh, and this is, of course, an, an, an unavoidable aspect of all technical systems. They are material, and thus they generate positive feedback that do not contribute to the system's cohesion and closure, but rather open it up in, in different ways. Uh, today we are familiar with a number of theorists and philosophers emphasizing the inescapability of noise as a condition for signaling, as well as communication in general. It has been a constant in the work of Michel Serres since long, for example. But it was also a firm and it was a major source for aesthetic rejuvenation in the tape recorded poetics of the post for decades. The case in point that has already been mentioned was Burroughs. Another related case uh, found in the vicinity of music and sound art is a w famous work by Alvin Lucier, a famous work and performance piece by. Uh, Oh, there it is. Uh, thanks. Uh, a piece by Alvin Lucier called, it's a famous piece of course, I'm Sitting in a Room, also from 1969. In this piece, the tape recorder is used in order to disassemble the voice and language as uh, controlling instances in the construction of the subject, <laughs> I must say. The performer sits in a room and reads the text into a microphone and records the words on a tape. The recording is played back through a loudspeaker and recorded on a second recorder. Then the procedure is repeated until the word and voice transformed into electric signals are ultimately turned into noise. We lose here with us encounter an active employment of the technology or technical system in a correct but excessive way which dissolves it while reminding of the noise and materiality of the grounds or systems of communication. Crucial in Lucier's piece is the excavation of the medium's different material layers, confronting not only the machine and the tape, but also the electric signals and the, and the magnetic fields they produce. The perhaps most fertile ground for this kind of experimenting during the period was the genre of sound poetry, during the post-war decades, that is. In sound poetry, both voice and body played, an important, played important roles in the investigations of, su of subjects and their surroundings roles that were constantly disassembled through manip manipulative technical operations with the tape and with the techno technologies used, such as the microphones and, 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 and loudspeakers. One of the most uh, important and prolific practitioners of sound poetry during these decades was, of course, the French poet Henri Chopin. Chopin ran the influential review OU, perhaps, yes, I think it was the first literary publication to include actual sound recordings on disc and graphic recordings. And he also composed a large number of poems on all during from the 1950s on until his death in 2008. Thank you. Um, Poems on us that specialized in the kind of archaeology of the voice, uh, uh, kind of poetry that wanted to uh, uh, <coughs> investigate the different layers of the, of the vocality and the body. Uh, by using microphones and contact microphones in an inventive way, Chopin was able to capture subvocal uh, and bodily sounds, as well as paralinguistic vocal expressions such as breath, cuffs cries and smacking of the tongue and lips. The, the embodied micro particles of language in action, one might say, in combination with 
the articulated word. As these sounds were converted into signals and magnetic patterns, they were manipulated through different operations on the tape recorder. Especially Chopin employed variation of recording speed and superimposition to construct, construct a strange soundscape founded on materialized and defamiliarized, defamiliarized voice of clicks, hissing, chirps and blips, as can be heard in important poems such as Le Col, from 1966, or, uh, or Le Ventre de Batigny from 1967. The weird sounds that are emitted from the loudspeakers in the work of Chopin and others impinge on the acousmatic, or the seemingly sourceless sound. And the effect on the listener can consequently be quite dissing. Since the experimental recording and manipulative post-production of Chopin were often supplemented with inventive loudspeaker, loudspeaker placements, <coughs> which contributed further to the sonic invasion of the listener's senses that penetrated and, and that embedded the listener, so to speak. The, the, this e effect of the dizziness or disorientation was easily heightened. As Steve Connor has remarked, we are never passive in relation to sounds. And I quote him here, we never merely hear sound, we are always also listening to it. Which is to say, selecting certain, certain significant sounds and isolating them from the background noise, which continue, continuously rumbles and rattles, continue, continually on the key deep for patterns of resemblance or recurrence. End of quote. This implies, moreover, the construction of a space with the, and I quote him here again, the ear condearing the eye to make out the space it finds itself in, and the quote. But the acoustic environments that surround the listener in much sound quoted complex, complicate such commandeering and invite an, an indeterminate and intersensorial activity of body and mind. In listening, for example, to a multi-track piece such as Amélie Chopin's Hoppa Bock, the title is actually Swedish because that was partly a collaboration with the Swedish sound for Sten Hansen, I think. The piece is from 1970. In listen, listening to a multi-track multi piece such as Chopin's Hoppa Bock, we are placed in a soundscape that necessitates an, an embodied engagement, but which forces us to leave behind the hope of anchoring our listening in the identification and the interpretation of some signs. Such a sonic space is more akin to the smooth space of the and Grattari, characterized by, the, by closeness, the haptic, and linkages in continuous variation as they arrive, than to an ordered Cartesian space that places a subject at a certain distance in front of a world of logical and ideological coordinates. The intermediation between different representational systems and between man and machine is here based on a poetics which excavates and activates the usually hidden material layers of a technology, uh, i.e. the tape recorder technology, the electric signals, and so on. A complex aesthetic ecology is hereby created in which we as listeners are immersed and which also passes through us but in no way firmly position us as subjects, as autonomous agents in front of an object or a landscape. Thus, if the works of Aconci and Vasco ironically stage the subject as an almost closed system, the acoustic ecologies of sound poetry are more diffuse, both in regard to the spaces and temporalities, the perceptions and the subjectivities that they produce. They generate they generate, to put it briefly, quite a different distribution of the sensible, a different politics and aesthetics. Okay, now I'm getting closer to the end. Very close. Let us then eventually uh, return to the basement in Wuppertal in Germany in the early 1960s and to Nam Jun Pike's uh, beautiful installation, Random Access. I didn't mention it before, but its title will, of course, today direct our attention to another kind of media technology than the tape recorder and to a specific part of, of the digital computer, which establishes a concrete material link to the history of sound recording. The, cha the, the cha chaotic haphazard pattern of audio tape on the gallery wall, as the, which we saw, and I can go back to the <coughs> 
you know, probably seen before, but still. There you go. Um, the pattern of audio tape on the gallery wall is at once a media archaeological, archaeological intervention into tape recording that subverts the seemingly inescapable linearity of tape as a storage medium and a gesture towards other models for memory or archiving of information, other media, other media practices. Something, something similar might be said of the editorial operations that I discussed earlier as one aspect of tape recording practices. They anticipate, to use a somewhat problematic term, uh, screen-based practices with digital media uh, that have been naturalized during the last decades. And also, the realist immediacy that was connected to both phonography and audio tape in different central registers might be actualized in a digital context in relation to the still flourishing ideology and dream of an immaterialized communication. Right. Perhaps there, there is even a fragile link to be found between the indexicality of the tape recordings <coughs> and some contemporary information ontologies claiming that the stuff of the universe can ultimately be reduced to binary digits and binary bits of information. This is just to say that beyond the obvious historical interest of, in tape recordings as an integral part of post-war culture and society, which had an immense impact on everyday life and as well as art, culture and politics, there are also several reasons to return to the media called this that emerged through and around it in order to make thicker the analysis of our contemporary media situation. In returning to Beckett's crap, our understanding of memory and its relation to technical archives of the old man-machine combination is further. In reading and listening to Ginsberg's poetry, the, the, the construct, deconstruction of self-presence is vividly concretized as a struggle between an authentic and self-expressive voice and the corrupting voice escapes or soundscapes of the media. With Burroughs and the conscious, the noisiness the noisiness in control systems based on negative feedback is exposed and made productive. In sound poetry and related media, in sound poetry, other media ecologies and ontologies are suggested, which challenge and undermine ordering binaries such as culture, nature, man, environment, subject, and object. Moreover, the works and activities briefly described and analyzed here in my talk are not representative as examples of some general history taking place, but are very much a material part uh, in a cultural transformation process that continues today. And magnetic media are still with us. They are part of the media as an apparatus, while at the same time offering critical deflections and diversions that can open up material and hence also aesthetic, political, and even epistemic cracks in such an apparatus. Cracks that might be wise to discover and disclose in contemporary <coughs> discussions of transparency, access, speed, and so on, whatever we discuss in relation to the digital networks. A genealogical and critical investigation of contemporary media ecologies and the digital capitalism of the current 24 7 society consequently demands an approach that includes narratives such as the ones about tape recording, even if, or rather because, they seem to be slightly off track a narrower history of computers and digital media. Thank you.